right, so it looks like our next section, we're gonna talk about some of the, uh, the housing and groove design guidelines. Great, I'm ready. As you all can see here, um, while all of these are very valid and very common groove and housing designs, um, some of them tend to be better in terms of EMI shielding and um, environmental sealing. For example, on the left, you see a flat gasket between um, a cover and a, and a housing. While typically a good environmental seal, it doesn't offer metal to metal contact um, and can therefore pose some, some design challenges. Um, one of the most common is there in the middle where you see a gasket designed into a groove. That's that solid O that Sierra talked about. And the benefit is that it provides a metal to metal contact. Whereas if at all possible, uh, on the right, you'll see a gasket designed into a groove along with a tortuous path. That tortuous path simply adds to the environmental ceiling as well as the, um, the EMI interference shielding. So I'm, I guess then, then this would really depend on the amount of shielding, possibly the exposure to water. You might not always have to design a torturous path. Do you think you should always right. design a torturous path? No, you definitely don't. Um, and you know, that option right there in the middle, like I said, is probably our most common. Um, it lends itself well, especially if you can if you can put in a groove. We realize that a lot of times applications aren't able to do that. So even that, that example on the left is going to be a great EMI seal, an environmental seal that can last decades um, if designed well and using proper materials. It looks like the fair slide, the gasket is actually exposed to the environment. Yeah, it is. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, especially considering that these conductive elastomers are meant to be an environmental seal. Good. One of the important things when considering housing design is also understanding how much force you have to compress some of these gaskets. So for example, cover thickness and bolt spacing um, are two pretty important factors when considering the type of elastomer, um, the hardness of the elastomer, and even the size of the housing overall. Sierra, have you had some experiences with this? I have, yeah, actually. Um, I had a customer that designed a box and it was probably a six inches by six inches and they only had one screw in each <laughs> corner. So there was a lot of leakage going on. But I, I mentioned to them, I said, okay, look, bolt spacing is to the fourth power over cover thickness to the third. They were trying to use bent sheet metal and the gaskets are very hard, 65 plus or minus shore A. So <laughs> we got them back on track. We uh, reduced the distance between bolts and we ended up passing the test. Especially because if you look at this, if you look at this equation, right? Um, some of the things when it comes to EMI gaskets aren't really controllable. Um, so for example, gasket deflection force for most profiles or most materials are gonna be about the same, but things like bolt spacing or cover thickness might have a little bit more design flexibility depending on how early you are in the process. Definitely something important to look at in the beginning. A lot of common mistakes made around housing design. So compression forces, I mentioned we'd be talking about this a little while ago. So if you notice, here's the different types of profiles that we were talking about. And if you look at the chart, there's a minimum a nominal and a maximum deflection range. And solido, 10% minimum, 18% max uh, nominal, and 25% max. However, a flat strip, 5% minimum, 10% nominal, 15% of the height. It's really important to design your gasket to be properly compressed. These gaskets are filled with free-floating metal particles. So not having the minimum compression will actually prevent the particles from touching and not give you shielding or grounding that you're looking for. Whereas if you have greater than the recommended compression value, you can actually crush the little particles and reduce the ability for the gasket to spring back after taking a compression set, say in heat or cold environments. It's really important to pay attention to these compression forces. And Sierra, I guess, the deflection ranges don't really matter when it comes to things like the size of the gasket. So for example, if you had a, a gasket that's 70, a solid O profile that's 70 thousandths versus a solid O profile that's a quarter of an inch, you're still looking for that same compression range, right? Correct, yeah, good question. All right, so there's always a lot of questions around gasket adhesion options. 
we've talked already about friction fitting a hollow O into a groove. Um, we've briefly touched on spot bonding. A lot of you have dealt with um, sheet stock with pressure sensitive adhesive. So it's always important to refer to the elastomer handbook for exact groove dimensions to fit existing profiles. We have all of the recommended groove dimensions for hollow or solid O's, mushroom D's, but there are certain situations where you can't friction fit like in a solid profile. So what you need to do if you're worried about it popping out is spot bond it. We like to tell you to use a non-conductive RTV to match the binder system. So if you have a silicone gasket, you're gonna to wanna to spot bond it with a silicone RTV. Same with a fluorosilicone gasket, you're gonna to wanna to use a fluorosilicone RTV. Ben, do you know why we recommend non-conductive adhesive versus using a conductive adhesive? Yeah, so typically non-conductive adhesives will actually have a better adhesive strength or a lap shear force. Um, a lot of conductive adhesives end up sacrificing, sacrificing some of their force because of the conductive particles. Additionally, the conductive particles in a conductive adhesive can add to the galvanic mismatch between the substrate or the frame, the gasket, and the adhesive itself, which just adds more to the equation um, and typically complicates the process. Sierra, one of the, the options on here is rivets um, or bolts. Can you describe how that would work with some of our gaskets? So, for instance, we looked at a hollow P design, which is like a hollow D, but with a leg coming out. Sometimes you need to mechanically fasten your gasket. Um, PSA may not be robust enough. Uh, it could be a, a very critical application where it has to adhere and rivets can be very helpful. Also, compression stops can be needed in cases where you're afraid that someone could over torque the gasket. So we all make fun of the Navy, the 18 year old kid on the deck of a Navy ship. He's the one that you design for because you're trying to make it foolproof. So if you are worried about things like over compression of your gasket, compression stops. If you're worried about the gasket falling off, you can rivet it on. But yeah, good question. Well, let's talk a little bit about groove basics. It's a pretty quick slide. We like to use straight rectangular grooves for elastomers. Tongue and grooves can be used with caution. We should try to contact applications, make sure that we've got the right profile if that's what you're stuck with at the time. Dovetails are a no-go. We do not like dovetails. And we'll talk about that as why, but um, dove, don't use dovetails. So what you're saying is that we should absolutely never, ever use dovetails if you can get away with it. Correct. And we'll talk about why in the common mistakes section at the end. Another important thing you have to really consider when designing your, your housing and your groove is the bend radius. So say you have a, a hollow O and you design a 90 degree corner, that hollow O is gonna pinch and what happens, Ben, when you pinch a gasket in a groove? Yeah, I mean, if you pinch the gasket in the groove, you're really no longer maintaining that original profile that it was extruded as. Um, what that means is you're probably not getting the, the ideal sealing um, at that point where it's pinched or bunched up. Um, you're also probably not getting a great electrical contact, which could sacrifice some of your EMI shielding. So you're saying if we pinch, you can get leak points for water and EMI. Exactly. Ah, so yes, you want to make sure you have a minimum bend radius, which is in the catalog. So keep that in mind. One of the types of uh, shapes that we haven't talked about yet um, is a, a die cut gasket. So with a lot of shapes um, or a lot of applications, we can take large sheets of material and die cut standard or not standard shapes out of it. That could be rectangular, um, it could be all kinds of custom designs based on um, how the gasket needs to interface with uh, with a particular housing. Some of the key uh, key tips when it comes to die cutting is actually making sure that you take into consideration the wall thickness to the gasket uh, ratio thickness. Here's a great example of what it looks like when you design a gasket that's too large for a groove. So what you see here um, are pinch points and potential damage to the gasket 
while at the same time significantly increasing any kind of compression force needed to, to compress this gasket. This animation shows a gasket that's actually too small or undersized for the groove. Um, what you're getting here is less than 10% deflection or almost no deflection at all. Um, so you're really not getting any kind of electrical contact at this groove, um, while at the same time getting effectively no environmental sealing. Finally, we've got the Goldilocks gasket. So it's a gasket that's designed properly for the groove to make sure that there's no overfill of the groove so the gasket isn't being damaged while at the same time compressing the gasket, the proper deflection range, in this case for a solid O between 10 and 25%. Sierra, I know you wanted to touch on some of the common mistakes when it came to housing and group design. Yes, there are some very important ones. Um, the one we've been alluding to is not using a, a dovetail. And the reason why is conductive elastomer gaskets should always be designed in compression. We don't want to design in shear or tension or rotation of any kind because of FOD concerns. So you can install a, a gasket into a dovetail groove. It could shear on the way out. If you're trying to take it out, it could shear on the way in. The other point is that elastomer gaskets need a minimum of three points of contact to create a ground or a shield. If you have a gasket that is underfill in a dovetail groove, it could give you as little as only one point of compression, which is not going to give you shielding or grounding or water sealing for that matter. <laughs> Another common mistake is, is trying to apply grease to the gasket. The point of grease is to reduce friction and you're not using this in friction. So it's one common mistake, but the other more important, less recognized is the fact that it, if you put too much, it can cause a dielectric barrier between your housing and your gasket. Ben, have you ever seen anyone try to use conductive grease before? It's honestly becoming less and less common um, in applications to use conductive greases. Typically, they aren't really needed, and it touches back to, to one of our points earlier about adding um, additional materials that may create a uh, galvanic mismatch between the substrate, the gasket, and the grease itself. Good point. And then the other common mistake is applying too much adhesive when you're spot bonding. Uh, we talked about using a non-conductive adhesive. Ben, ben spoke to that. It's because it's a thinner, you can put a tiny drop and it's not electrically conductive. So trying to use a conductive adhesive is thick. It can cause bumps in your fill and your gap won't be perfectly flat. And, um, and it's really just trying to hold it into place. Sierra, I mean, a lot of the common, the common differences or common mistakes in this section um, are basically treating a conductive gasket like a non-conductive gasket. So, for mm -hmm. example, I know a lot of non-conductive gas gaskets actually require or look for a dovetail groove or need some kind of grease. In this case, conductive elastomers are just about the opposite. I really recommend just designing your box to house an EMI gasket from the beginning. Assume that you're going to have EMI issues because it's way more difficult to take a non-conductive gasket and then design in a conductive gasket due to the compression forces, the groove sizes, underfill. Maybe you designed a dovetail groove and now you need an EMI gasket and you have to change your whole groove design. You know, so I, I think it's important to just harden the system for EMI, and then when you go through your testing and you don't need it, it's easier to put a non-conductive in there. It's a, it's a cost down and you're the hero. 